Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you're in YouTube, you'll see a little link down below. You can click on it and register and become part of this in the Zoom if you feel like doing that, if you don't want to just listen on YouTube. And you'll be part of the conversation. You can do that. Uh, if, if this is the first time you're here, uh, let me introduce you and walk you around a little bit. Uh, you're probably in the attendee area. Um, the, there's attendees and panelists. The difference between the attendees and the panelists is the panelists got here early. Uh, we open at 6 a.m., and uh, I can't promise anything from 6 to 6.30. We're just having a good time. We're having our coffee and tea and talking about things and telling stories. And, and uh, sometimes it's technical and sometimes it's not. Uh, but from 6 to 6.30, we start, we start getting, getting our engines going. Uh, at 6.30, between 6.30 and 6.40, we, uh, we open up um, for the, the Discord. So we put a Discord link out. Uh, if you haven't joined Discord, it's where we all talk. There's almost 600 of us that are talking between all these events. Um, so you can, uh, you can join us there and, and continue to have the conversation. We put the link out by seven o'clock when I'm doing this, the link is expired. So you'll have to come back another day. Uh, at between 6.40 and 6.45, we start mic checks. So we go through every person in the panel to make sure they've got good audio, good video, and good internet. Um, and uh, so we do those mic checks. Once we've, if you come in and you've seen, uh, you see us doing the mic check, there's no reason to raise your Zoom hand to uh, join. You can't. Uh, we've closed the we've closed the panel for the day. So um, just take that into account. Uh, you want to try to be here by 640 if you'd like to join the panel. And if you see us saying things that are that you think are crazy that you know better, well, then join join. We'd love to have you on the panel. Uh, we have a great panel. And it's always getting better because every week, a couple more people, you know, join a couple more people become part of this, and it just keeps getting richer and richer. So uh, we definitely would like to see you join uh, if you uh, if you feel like you have something to contribute to the conversation. Um, from seven until eight, we're going to do general questions uh, that you can add those questions in the Q&A. Our request is that you keep them under five lines, really under five lines. Don't put more, don't write really long questions. We can't, we can't process those. Um, also one question per post and don't put any comments in there. The comments are for the chat. You can put comments, as many comments as you want in the chat, but don't put them in the Q and A area. We'll just dismiss it. Um, so, uh, so that's, that's kind of the rules of engagement for seven to eight. If you see questions there, it's better to ask the questions at the beginning of the hour. And it's really good to vote on them um, because if you vote on those questions, it really tells us what you want to hear. We spend a little bit more time on the questions at the beginning of the hour than on the end. We try to answer all the questions, which means at the end, uh, sometimes it's just yes, no, blue, green. Uh, we just kind of move through things really quickly because we're running out of time. Uh, we have a second hour uh, each day, which is um, from eight to nine. Um, and that second hour, we usually pick one subject. So on Mondays, we often do education, Tuesdays, audio. Today, we're talking cameras, and we've got Chris Summers here. He's going to be uh, talking about camera support and safety, remote heads, camera rigging, tricky rigs, uh, vehicles and safety at work. So uh, Chris is going to be uh, talking through that with us today from eight to nine. So keep your camera, those types of questions for the second hour. Tomorrow, we've got um, uh, Phil Hodgetts from, uh, from Lumberjack Systems, and he's going to be talking um, about gathering metadata on set. So whether it's for documentaries or reality or film, the more data you get on set, the, the more you're going to, the, the cleaner your uh, post-production is going to go. And he's going to talk about how to, how to capture that and what's important and how you do it. On Friday, we've got Steve Wright, uh, who is the author of Digital Compositing for Film and Video, and he's discussing green screen. Now, Steve, Steve Wright's taught a lot of us how to do green screen, taught me how to do green screen. So uh, his book is, is, uh, is um, very important to most people who do a lot of green screen. Almost all of us have it in our library. So it's pretty exciting to have Steve here, um, and he will uh, be here on Friday. And um, we'll, uh, we'll uh, be able to um, ask a question. So if you've got green screen questions, save them from then and bring them in. And he'll, uh, he'll be there to talk about really the, the technology behind it. And he's really going to be talking, you know, nuke level uh, green screen, but really how it all works. And so that should be exciting. Anyway, if you, uh, if you like what, you, what you're seeing here and you want to share it with others, you can put it any, anywhere you want. Here's the link. Uh, it's in the chat. So you can um, go ahead and share that and bring other people in. Uh, the bigger this gets, um, the more we can do. Uh, we get to have cooler speakers. We get to have a better panel. We get to have better questions. Uh, the more the merrier. So uh, definitely share this if you if you think that it's useful. Um, anyway, without further ado, we will get started. Uh, Chris, what do we got? Alex, before we get started, I just want to say congratulations. I believe that this is show number 100. And I think on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you for what you've done, not only is it a great place to learn and make friends, but in a world filled with a lot of chaos and rumble and craziness, 
it's nice to have a couple hours a day where we can concentrate on something and think about something more positive. So thanks for doing this. And uh, it's been great. And 100 well, shows you. is a big deal. So congratulations. Thank First you. And, and, and I, I and I want to thank everybody that comes, you know, it, it's just, a, it's, I have this crazy, I had this crazy idea when I started and I figured, well, we'll do it for a couple of weeks and we'll see how it goes. And there was some point, I don't know when we, I think when we opened discord where I realized we're probably not going to turn this off, you know, like it's like, this is, this is, it has a life of its own, but that happened because of everybody here, of people showing up, uh, contributing. Uh, and, and this gets, it's not something that I could, I could calculate that this was going to happen that, you know, I figured I just answer questions for a little while. And now we suddenly have all these very, very smart folks that are in this panel that are making it richer and richer and richer and, and great questions. And, and um, anyway, so I just want to thank everybody in the, all the attendees and the panelists and, and uh, you know, I'm just excited to see where this, where this goes. So anyway, hundred episodes you. is a big well, deal. As the first person to register, <laughs> I, I just have to say that I knew that a hundred days on, this is exactly where we'd be. And so <laughs> uh, I just, thank you for sticking out. And uh, yeah. <laughs> it's good to be here 100 days later. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Grant. <laughs> okay. Right. Let's get to the Q&A. First question is from Wouter in Amsterdam. Uh, he says he, he needs some advice on an SD and HDMI cable testers. And then he qualified that saying, uh, sorry, SDI. And that probably means two different devices. So cable tester suggestions. Yeah, go ahead, Tucker. Um, I really wish I still had access to it. Quantum Data 780, uh, the 780 series from Quantum Data. They have one that will do HDMI and SDI. It does full bandwidth. It's uh, it, you. It's literally the be all end all tester for these things. Um, it will do HTCP tests. It'll do CEC. T I mean, it, literally anything. Uh, but they're ten thousand dollars. Yeah, I was gonna say the. Yeah, there's there also one that's uh, I get to actually say oh this one's um, that's the handheld one that that um, is being put up there uh, thirty five hundred dollars only thirty five hundred dollars um, the the ones that we use a lot on site are also the Fabrics so Fabrics makes a series of them there's some that are um, kind of a half rack small one that'll do twelve G and you know give you a bunch of displays and that'll look at everything down to packet inspection. So it's gonna look at all the little, um, you know, you can look at your bank 20, line 21 and see what's going through it. You can see the SDI signal um, going through that process. And then there's handheld ones. The, the ones that we get on site are everywhere from 12 to 20 grand, now depending on what we're putting in there. Um, the small handheld ones are six or $7,000. Um, I don't know of a lot of less expensive ones you know, once you get below $3,500, they're kind of like, it's a monitor, you plug it in and see if it works. You know, like there's not a lot of, not a lot of tools that I've seen that analyze those things or analyze the cables very well. Um, I haven't seen a lot of good, I feel like there should be ones that are, um, that are based on, you know, just software, but I haven't seen them, you know, um, I, I've just generally seen those. So I don't, does anyone have any less expensive ones? I think that that's, those are the ones that we, that we know of. All right, next question. Those that's, but favorite Fabrics is the one, I mean, Tucker's are, is great. I've not used that one, but Fabrics are the ones that we see everywhere. You know, everybody's got, someone has one somewhere in a, and it's, Fabrics is P-H, uh, I think it's P-A, uh, P-H-A-B-R-I-X, I think. Um, but, but that's the one that we see it. Somebody's got one on every show that we do um, typically. Anyway, next question. Kevin McArdle says he needs a suggestion for a webinar platform that allows for a bit of customization on the landing page and can build extra pages that can accommodate 25,000 people. And it needs to be InfoSec solid for government use. And please try not to delete them so quickly because I'm using I did not. Them. Oh, someone did, else it, did. No, uh, Michael Tucker went above. If you look, it's the Oh, Kevin got McArdle's it. Okay. They got to fix that. They, they, they anyway, organize. so yeah, um, uh, I don't think that there's anything out there that fits those that um, requirement at the moment. I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen anything that does that does that well. Um, Is the infosec? I'm sure the hard part. Yeah, yeah. Once you get into infosec, what I does mean, that mean? It just means that it's hardened. I mean, you, there's a whole bunch of series of rules that have to happen once you say infosec for the government. 
there are a series of security rules and, and how it manages data and how everybody touching it has to be, you know, um, cleared. And, you know, there's a whole, so once you say infosec, or, or like when you say it to me anyway, and you say government, um, what I'm assuming is now every person that touches that, and, and there's a whole series of rules about where it goes and where is all the data stored and, you you know, putting it into the cloud becomes super complicated, you know, as far as, you know, and generally it's going to have to be a local instance inside of something else that's there. And it might have to be within government servers or within, and I, I might be taking it further than Kevin is, is asking for, but when someone says government infosec solid for government, what that means is that you need to be able to instance it um, in a very specific way to manage security and access um, against state actors. And that's not, that's not a, I mean, that's a pretty complicated um, thing to do. And most of these web, these webinar platforms are not built for that. Um, Jason and then Peter. There is, um, there's an entire branch of the military that like, if you were to actually just call them as a civilian, it's called JITIC. Having dealt with this before, I can tell you they they are the people whose only job it is to be sure that you're compliant with whatever you need. So I would start there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Go ahead. Um, and then uh, Jeffrey, and then I, I'm you got to you guys got to keep your hands up until I call you because I, otherwise I won't see you. Jeffrey, and then uh, Stephen. Uh, the bigger issue is the fact that he's he's looking for twenty five thousand. I don't know if you'll be even able to do that in a secure uh, situation. Right. I mean, that's the, there's a lot of, that's a pretty complicated solution. Peter? Well, I was just going to say, that's the, re, the InfoSec requirements is the reason AWS has a unique instance for the federal government. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Stephen? Yeah, for the bank, we've, the best we've been able to do is 128 endpoints, and we have over $4 million in building it. Yep. Yeah. So it's, that's a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty heavy, steep thing at the moment. Uh, next question. Uh, Michael Tucker says, has anyone used, I believe he means Microsoft Stream, which is part of the Office three, uh, 365, as a paid service? No. Next question. Sorry, we don't have, oh, oh go ahead. Paul has, Paul has, Paul's waving. There we go. I, this is the problem with so many windows. All right, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> yes, I, I've done uh, two webinars with it so far. So, what do you think? Um, it's pretty good, actually. Once you once you get around the quirks, um, it's okay. What it are works. the quirks? Um, it doesn't require a um, stream key. So setting up the um, uh, the ATM Mini Pro got me stuck for a little bit, and then I realised that any stream will work as a stream key. So then then it then it worked fine. Does that is that a, is that a security issue? Now that we just talked about infosec, that there's no stream key <laughs> that you can just push it into any ingest and it would and off you go. Well, the thing is that it's it within uh, Microsoft's own environment. So I'm, they, they also have a government branch. So, and I've just been reading that they actually have stream in the government branch. So that's probably why. Got it. Okay. All right. Next question. Uh, Kathy Sanders says, any recommendations on whether I should purchase the HD240 from Sennheiser or the... Or mix 280. HD280. Oh, I'm sorry. 280. Uh, or the Mixify Studio headphones with built-in audiophile amp. Jeff. Oops, she says Yeti. Sennheiser. Sennheiser. Love them. Just buy the Sennheiser. Yeah. You'll be happy. Uh, Mick, Mickey? Yeah, the HD280 is sort of a staple in, in sound, so go with that. Okay, there you go. Next question. It's a new world. Uh, Abraham Barrera says, best place to learn Unreal Engine. <laughs> um where's where's nick? nick is nick here was he here he, he was here a little while ago no so so the uh so we're most saturdays not this saturday but most saturdays we're spending an hour talking about unreal engine it's a great, great place to ask questions it's probably not the only place to go for unreal engine uh, but note that there's a lot of pretty good training unreal spending a lot of training on their site so they're the base site to do that i know i i just pushed unreal engine at my my son wanted to learn it i pushed it pushed it at him and he did the first tutorial and he was running around playing a game. And I was like, why are you playing games? He's like, I made it. <laughs> you know, so he just followed the instructions that were on there. So there are some, uh, there's definitely some stuff to get you kind of into the, into the mix of it. We're planning to do much more here. Um, right now, we're just kind of getting our wits about us, uh, about how we're going to do that. But we're going to do a lot more here. Um, I think that there are some, some videos up on, on LinkedIn Learning as well. But I think that the most current stuff is probably the stuff that's on Unreal Engine's uh, learning site, which is 
pretty robust. I mean, you can spend a fair bit of time doing that. And does anyone else have any other suggestions, Elliot? It's a huge topic, right? So, so there's so many different areas you can go into. I've, I'm really interested in really customizing some of the lower level stuff. And there's a course on Udemy, um, Unreal Engine with C++, that's actually really, really great. Great. Yeah, absolutely. But I, the one thing I will say about that course, because it stopped us for a little while, is that that you, I would try to learn Unreal without the C++ part first. I mean, it just it just creates another lift of stuff. And I think that we were trying to figure out how we're going to get that all working, where you can just learn how the interface works as you know, getting over the hump of being able to throw things together. You don't need to code to, you know, make unreal useful. You do need to make it to make, to scale at some point you need it, but you, you don't need to code to do that. So don't let the C plus plus part scare you off. Yeah, they, um, in they've the, got two in versions. Process. They've got one for C plus plus and one for blueprint. So you can pick, pick which, oh, what you prefer. Yeah, and, and I definitely think C++ is going to help. I just don't think you want to get caught up in, oh, I have to learn that too, where you can get a lot done in Unreal without the code. Leland? I just left a link for LinkedIn, which actually has a paid training that you can get access to for a month for free ahead of time to mm. try it out and see if you like it. Yep, absolutely. Next question. Uh, TJ Worrell says, um, this is interesting, if using a black magic design pocket cinema camera 4K or 6K, as an input to an ATEM 2ME production studio 4K, will I maintain camera control if I convert the HDMI to SDI at the camera? We would use the Blackmagic HDMI to SDI micro converters, unless advised otherwise, by the illustrious panel. Nope. Does Absolutely not. <laughs> not even a little bit. Yeah, not, not just, a little bit. It, it just doesn't, no. it's, it's different protocol. It won't, it won't pass. So anyway, that, you, 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 the, the minis uh, control the 4K and the 6K. The SDI ones control all the other cameras through SDI. Mm -hmm. But if you, once you go through a converter for either one, this confuses a lot of folks. Uh, but once you go through, the, you also, it will not work. The HDMI out of, the HDMI going out of your micro also will not allow you to control it through the mini, which has been a confusion for some folks. So, so um, there are two different generations of things. So the, um, the minis are, will, will oper interoperate with the 4K and the 6K. The, the other switchers will interoperate with all the other cameras that are in the Blackmagic group. At some point, I could see them all coming together, but there are two different worlds right now. Anyway, next question. I would imagine a great PDF explaining all that. Um, I can't pronounce this name. Uh, what's a good way to set up simple live stream monitoring to check for audio quality, dropped frames, and connection quality? What do people use for that? Live stream. There's some, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Synergy. Synergy has a great multi-viewer that you can bring in RTPs and all, RTMPs, all kinds of different sources. Can you, can you uh, spell that out just to make sure people have it? Sure. Uh, C-I-N-E-G-Y, I believe. Synergy. And how much is it? I uh, think the multi-viewer was only like $1,200 or something like that. twelve or $1,500, somewhere yep. in that range. That's great. Next question. Wait. Uh, okay. Oh, you got one, Leland? Go ahead, Leland. You were, you were going to... Just one thing. For anyone using vMix, it's actually a built-in diagnostics that'll watch your uh, sources dropped, your rendering dropped, your resync, your queue, your video, and audio streams to make sure everything's running peachy. That's great. Next question. I like this one. Wouter, again, from Amsterdam says, is there a list of abbreviations used by professionals, like the number two up? Etc. So I can label my video configurations and audio mixers. <laughs> this I Sorry. love this because I'm so into like I've been using the same brief. Yeah. Well, the problem is is that is that it's also every country is a little bit different. You know, so for instance, a technical director in the United States is a vision mixer in in uh, you know in most of Europe. You know, and. And so you, which vision mixture makes way more sense than technical director because the technical director in the United States is also the person managing power and crew and things like there's a, we have technical directors that mean two different things on the same show. So it doesn't necessarily, the reason that we call it technical director, of course, is because you're, you're technically directing it, but not, there can be a director director that's just calling the shots, but it's, uh, that's just one example. Um, you know, super source isn't even, you know, some people call them multi views, you know, so those are multi views to us, they're super sources to that, you know, they're and so there's, I don't think that there's a, um, a hard list of those, it would be fun to put together a list of general terms that these things could mean, um, someone should do that, I'm not going to do it right now, but but I, it seems like such a good idea, but it's I don't know if there's any, 
I don't know if there's any list anywhere that that describes them, but they do come up there. There's a doc- dictionary that wants to be made there about terms when someone says that you can just kind of roll up on your on your phone. What does he mean by that? But um, does anyone know of any other list? No. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Not a, not a list, but the other problem is that there are all sorts of regionalisms in this so that the, the onset language used by somebody on the East Coast is going to vary a little bit for the language used on the West Coast. So it gets to be really complicated. It's almost like regional dialects and language. And so I, I don't know and if there's I, a And I will say list. that set language is a lot more stable than video production language. You know, the what people call things on a set, you know, when they're talking about different C stands or lights or that type of thing seems to be a much more, uh, what we don't see as much variance in video crews. It's like all over the place, you know, that people are making, you know, and, um, and again, once you go into a broadcast truck, it tends to be very, it, it tends to be more stable as well, because it's the same crews working around all over uh, the region. Go ahead, Tucker. Yeah, I mean, really, just to echo what Bill's saying, just get comfortable asking those questions and and be able to ask them. Just be real clear with your question of, you're doing this thing. I want to be able to refer to it. What do you call it? Uh, and just yeah. learn. Anytime you come into a new crew, that's going to be a thing. Chris? When I used to switch sports, quite often I was dealing with the away team. So I was dealing with directors from all over the country. And the first thing I would do is I'd ask the director, you know, how are you going to call for this? How are you going to call for this? How are you going to call for this? Because there could be variances. Yeah, no, absolutely. Next question. Sometimes it's personality. Um, uh, Karen Foote says, best super budget, Alex, you can't uh, chime in, super budget under $100 USB microphone for podcasting. Hold your opinion. Hold your opinion. Super budget. Let's go, guys. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Okay, I would say the uh, Audio Technic- Technica ATR2100, which is what I use, and it's what Colin uses. Uh, Roscoe and then Jason, and then we'll go on. Oh, can't hear you, Roscoe. One more try. There we go. Using the space bar again, aren't you? No. Keystrokes. You still can't hear you. Okay, Jason, go ahead. Uh, my, my first thought is no, please don't do that. Second thought would be anything from Rode that's within your budget and you just expect to be doing a fair bit of pre-production or post-production and watching your meters. Yeah, and the, and the one we've sent out to folks that have been under hundred dollars is generally the audio technica. I think you said the 2100, I think that's the one that we've, that's got a USB, you know, connection to it. And when we send stuff out as part of a smaller kit, that's exactly what we've a- used. ATR 2100. And it also yeah. has a XLR port as well. Yep. So you can upgrade yep. it. Yeah, it's got I both. saw that this morning on your mic. I thought that was cool. Next question. Next question. Uh, Wouter, again, from Amsterdam, says, any suggestions where to get a good 101 tutorial on MIDI and a 101 tutorial on OSC? <laughs> I don't know OSC Ev- Evidently OSC. not. Go ahead, Yashai. And then Jeff. Groove. Then and then we'll go. Yeah, on. Uh, Groove 3. And I think another one called Ask Video. They really do an awesome job. I think you can find media and all that stuff. Great. Jeff and then Leland. I, I guess there's just so much to determine on which MIDI and where you're trying to use it for, too. There, I mean, that's just a huge, huge and, and section with of a, information. Yeah, with a lot of, uh, I guess I'm, uh, what I will say about a learning a lot of things, whether it's MIDI or coding or whatever, is figure out what you want to do and then go find either people or things that tell you how to do that thing. And you may not do it perfectly at the beginning, but you just having a, co- a context for what you're trying to learn for that moment is much easier to learn than just trying to open up and just try to figure out. And there, there is kind of a hello world that you need to know, understand to get around. But the best thing that you're going to be able to do is say, I'm trying to control this with this MIDI and then just start Googling for it, you know, like, you know, and then come up here and ask questions and, you know, go on discord and, and bring it up and, and, you know, have, you know, fill up with questions and then, and then try to solve those questions uh, re- specifically related because these, a lot of these are so big that it's really hard to solve it. Otherwise, um, I Leland and then lean more towards oh, ahead, OSC, lean more towards OSC as a control uh, interface versus old MIDI because OSC can, is just easy. Can you define OSC as it relates to oh. MIDI? Open sound control, I think mm-hmm. that's what it is. But uh, I don't know. I've always referred to it as right. OSC. It's basically MIDI over Ethernet of sorts, but okay. it's just it's very easy to address and very easy to set up. Leland, and then Tucker, and then MJ. 
He pretty much covered everything that I was going to bring okay. into the conversation. Okay. Tucker? Yeah, I would say it sounds like he's asking specifically about like device control or um, something where you're trying to push a button and make a thing happen. Uh, uh, MIDI, you could, there's like three different real zones for MIDI uh, as far as understanding. Is it for a piano player getting a note? That sort of thing. Uh, there's a couple couple different veins there. Um, but yeah, being able to connect with context, I think, is, is it. And then um, there was something else, but it took too long for me. Okay. Yep, MJ. Yeah, I was just going to say, I've done uh, quite a bit with Open Sound Control, OSC. Great place to start is hexler.net. I'll post a link in the chat room, but they make an application called Touch OSC that is for Mac and iPads, iPhones, and you could create your own little custom um, OSC controllers. They have a bunch of templates. It's a good place to start, break it, and rebuild things. So I'll, I'll throw it in there. I remembered. Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Tucker. If you, if you are... If you get into MIDI and you're starting to get interested and you find something that was built before 1995, do not plug it in to your modern equipment until you have verified because it does not follow a current a standard. And I have blown up things that way. There's a lot more voltage there. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Good to know. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. Uh, Paul King says, uh, can we enable closed captioning for the next office hours to increase uh, accessibility? Uh, Rev's live captioning is pretty awesome and can be used when we're not live on YouTube. So I'm 100% behind that. What I don't understand about Rev, I went to their website after this was posted. This just happened recently where Rev is providing this and it says $20 per user. But what I don't understand is what are they defining as users? So they're really unclear on their website what that means. And, and if someone wants to do some research and find that out, I would absolutely be happy to pay 20 bucks a month to have this. The problem we have is that it's limited to 80 hours, which we will go through in two weeks. Um, so we'll figure that out, what, what that what that means. Maybe it's that we buy two of them. And I'm fine with that. You know, like that, that doesn't bother me at all to put closed captioning in. Um, the the main thing that I what I don't understand is the how the pricing works. Is everyone is just a, one person sourcing it? Is that the pricing? Or is it everybody that's in the group? Or is it, you know, I don't understand their pricing. I, and Rev is a good service. I've used them for multi-language and everything else. They're, they're great. And I'd love to put closed captioning in. Um, I just love haven't had time. Demo. I just saw it come by. I'd love to come. I'd love to go. And I may try to contact them. I know some folks there. I may try to contact them and say, Hey, like, can we just put it in here so that people can see it? Um, and so we may, we may try to kind of go, go down that path. Um, but I couldn't understand what the pricing meant on their website, which is why I didn't jump immediately on it. I was like, well, I got to figure this out. And it's only been, I think, I think it's pretty recent that they posted it. But anyway, to get to answer your question, 100% behind doing it, I just need to understand what is necessary and what it means. And I, I'm not clear what that is yet. So um, if someone wants to do some more research on it and get back to us, that'd be great. Next question. Uh, next question. Dan Burt says, uh, WLM meter, Waves, com it, um, this is not well written, but Waves has a discount right now posted on their website of 40% off. He wants to know if he should jump at it. Go ahead, Tucker. Uh, with Waves, if it's $29, buy it uh, if, you, if you need it or want it, because that's usually at some point during the year, it will come down to $29. And that's usually the like, okay, I can buy it now. Um, otherwise, if you need it, buy it at whatever price it is. Um, and then Black Friday is by far the best deal they have. Uh, not the pre-Black Friday deal, but the actual Black Friday deal. That's the problem with doing sales, by the way, is that people get good at them and then they just figure out, you know, how to manage it. Weird. You might as well just make the price the price. Yeah. Anyway, you're shy. Uh, the WM come in two flavor, uh, WM and the WLM plus. And right now it's in for 35. I think you should get it because the plus actually allow you to apply the correction of the gain and the loudness and everything. So it's a better deal, in my opinion. So 35 is pretty close to 29. Next question. Uh, Darren McMahon says, hypothetical, oh, this, Darren, this is really long. Uh, you know what? I'm going to let you, um, I'm going to let you redo that. Sorry. Rules. Uh, Wooter again says, any suggestions? Um, oh, no, you got that one. I already did that one. Uh, Attila says, is there a way to live stream to multiple platforms while also outputting horizontal as well as vertical versions of a feed? thinking along the lines of YouTube Live as well as Instagram Live at the same time. Go ahead, Jeff. Vector, we can do it. 
Yeah, and and uh, yeah, and and like for instance, the the way the way I would do it, I, I, Instagram is a little bit more complicated because of, it's Instagram, but it could definitely be done. Um, you use Yellow Duck to get the RTMP code, which everyone should use. Is Yellow Duck to um, to uh, find Instagram's uh, RTMP ingest because screw those guys. Anyway, so um, uh, you know, it's just buttheads. Anyway, um, you know, so the Clean so the Clean um, show. Clean show. I, I use butt. I, I had other I had other things. Anyway, we're everyone should everyone should stream. Try to to do illegal streams to Instagram. They have never turned any. They sometimes will stomp on your streams. So be careful of a high profile stream to Instagram. Uh, they will. There's people I know at Instagram or at Facebook that can push a button and kill your stream. And so if they see that you're obviously doing that or they, they, they get it, they sometimes will do it just, just because they want to keep it unstable. Um, but the, uh, in general, you get away with it and they should just open up RTMP. Like, and so us forcing that issue, they can't turn it off because there's stars that are, you know, high profile people using it. So they can't like kill it. So all of us should take advantage of that. Now to get back to your question, uh, any encode if you have a if you have an encode if you have two encoders or two ways to instance the encoder you can stream it in two different ways you pass that in um you know you have to decide whether you're just doing a center cut for the nine by 16 uh or you're doing some kind of something that's more um custom which is going to be harder to to make we've done ones where we've actually done picture in picture where we're animating it and moving it around to re reframe it um live using uh, aja has a code is it i, I want to say covid but i don't think it is covid it's um but they have a a hardware box that lets us kind of pan and scan inside of the frame. Um, not, not, not the region of interest, which could work, but there's a bigger version of that, um, that is, uh, that will let us, um, uh, do that. And so you can, you can kind of move it around live as the nine by 16 inside of the 16 by nine, um, to make that work. But if you're just doing a center cut, any, you have two encoders, you have them two set up, take this in, grab, you know, cut this and with elementals we do it all the time um the uh, but you could do it inside of any any uh i think almost anything is just is to, is to grab those and have two separate instances to make it work vector will absolutely work um but there's a lot of ways to to make that to make that um happen you just need either two instances on a really powerful machine or or um multiple computers or the cloud vmix should probably be able to do it in the cloud and vector can do it in the cloud so those well, are a couple the problem ways. is actually is being able to do both a nine by 16 and a 16 by nine at the same time out of the same machine that's that's where the real challenge comes to then your destinations are still yet another challenge too right yeah so you can but you, you could you could get it done with like for instance ndi with a you know one source and put it up to two different um you know instances of your of your video or you could do it on online yeah next question uh, Curtis says, uh, Curtis Scott, my company is looking to make a few short videos for products and services. <clears throat> Excuse me. What software would you use to build these to output to multiple formats, web, mobile, showroom, et cetera? Well, you should hire an editor. Well, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just waiting to see who, yeah, go ahead, uh, Bill and then Leland. So for me, this is like asking this question. Uh, my sister's getting married in four months and we need some music. Would you mind learning to play the piano? <laughs> it's not the equipment that makes a video or anything else. It's the person operating it. And you have to learn how to do that. So uh, the software is really pretty much insignificant. Whatever you learn how to use, you can, all of them work. There, we have it's the golden era of NLE and video production software these days. You can get it for free. It's the skill involved. And so you just have to learn to play the piano first. That's what I'd send them to. It's mm -hmm. not a trivial thing. It's just not a yeah, trivial go thing. Uh, Leland? No, and he's right on that regard. I'll just throw three um, on the market software websites that you can take a look at that are pretty easy to use. Wave Video is one of them, W-A-V-E dot video. Revio is a second, revio.com, R-E-E-V-I-O. And the last one would be uh, renderforce.com, which has a lot of pre-built templates that you can start with. And that's pretty much the case out. Yeah. So. Chris, Chris, and then Jason. Yeah, the, those are interesting, Leland. And yeah, there's a lot of, you know, applications like that. What I would recommend, what I would recommend, because I'm an editor, is find, ask around, find somebody you can trust, let them walk you through the complex maze of dealing with the multiple format thing. And most people are, you know, fairly understanding that, you know, you're trying to learn and, and 
learn over somebody's shoulder who's done it a lot. That's, it's one of the things that as an editor, we deal with all the time. The, oh, by the, oh, by the way, 11th hour. Can, can we get that in vertical mm -hmm. also? Uh, Sky? I noticed that, that a lot of those have templates now, and maybe that's all you need just to drag and drop your story. Again, who's your audience and what do you want them to do? Yep. That's the first I question. mean, I I think that if you're looking at something that you're going to grow into, I would I would get a real real editor um, just to make it super quick. I would say that I would if you're cross platform, I'd probably think about DaVinci. If you're Mac, I would use Final Cut. If you're a PC, I'd probably use DaVinci or Premiere. Um, and I would. But the thing is, is don't just try to hack through it. Just take go get lessons, like have someone train you spend three or four days, get off the ground. Like, don't try to, like, hack your way through it. You're just going to you whatever you decide, learn it. Like when when Final Cut 10 came out, we just we all we brought Steve Martin and, uh, and and Mark Spencer in, and we all just spent five days coming up to speed, and then we were up to speed, you know. And and so you can start to do it. But I would I would get into if you're trying to do a couple things really quickly, then using something that Leland shows I think makes sense. If you're trying to build, like I'm going to be doing this all the time, because if your company is smart, they will be building them all the time, because you know video is super important and more important than it ever has been, and will continue to become more important um, to the point where your company is going to you know um, transactional. Uh, you know, transactional relationships through advertising is going to become less and less impactful. Relation, relationship um, content driven by content, relation, relationship communities and process and everything else is going to become more and more important as advertising becomes harder and harder to activate. You know, we're going to, we're going to watch the next decade as all the platforms get real at people and platforms get really good at pushing advertising off to the edge, you know, and you know, where people are tired of it. And when you're building a system that no one wants, um, it's hard, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, so I think that, you know, figuring out how to be the content and not be an interruption in the content is going to be more and more important as um, people get more and more facile at getting rid of ads. Anyway, next question. Are you there, Chris? Yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry. Uh, Gabriel says, uh, Chris Fenwick, could you please share your archival system for video prod projects? You mentioned in previous session, we were able to identify hard to, yeah. So the main thing, Gabriel, that you're looking for, I was trying to get a screen up. There's an application called Disk Catalog Maker, I believe is what it was. Uh, I always forget what it's called. Um, yes, Disk Catalog Maker, it's on the App Store. And the beauty of it is once you copy your stuff to another drive, whether it's an OEM drive or a, you know, like a, western digital book whatever number number those drives give them consistent names and then you drag that drive into the application disk catalog maker and it allows you to have a searchable database and it'll come back and say oh yes that file or that job that you're looking for is on drive you know 212 and then you go to the shelf and pull that drive um, but that's what i do been doing it for uh 25 years or so roughly um, Does anybody else want to answer the Chris final question? <laughs> Sorry, uh, no, nope, nope, no. Go ahead. Quick, oh, go ahead. quick follow up, Chris. Um, the LE version or the full version? If you even know the difference, you're probably using the full. I probably bought the full version. I kind of tend to go that way, and and I don't know what the difference is. Maybe it does more drives or something. But we have over 300 drives scanned into it, and it it searches in. You know, yeah, it's it's it's, it's life saving. I mean, if you're if you're doing those for for that that kind of thing, it's it's amazing. Um, I always wanted to build something that would that would you put all the drives in it and it would just let you just request drives one at a time and it would have like a hundred drives, but it wasn't like a raid. It was just like I just turn the drives on when you need them and everything else. And you can that was back when we had spinning drives. Drive for you yeah. if you want. Exactly, it but it was so easier. much more fun to build a machine. Go ahead, Roscoe, really quickly, and then Elaine, and then we'll move on. Yeah, it used to ship with Roxio Toast for free, so just find an old copy, buy it online, eBay, something yeah. like that, and you'd probably get it. Absolutely. I think Elaine. the newest version works with the more modern OSs, though. Final Cut Library Manager, if you're on Final Cut on a Mac, it's I've got about uh, 40, 50 drives set up, and all my projects go into, I buy little small SSDs, copy all the files, raw footage, everything on there. And once it's cat cataloged into this software, it'll tell you if it's online or not. And if you label them the same that you put on the lay on the drive, very simple. I like it. Like Alex said, keep your elbows yeah. close. So that's and yeah. it's expensive. <laughs> repeat, repeat the name, please. Final Cut what? It's Final, Final Cut, Cut Library Light. Manager. Yeah, it's pretty my, specific to a Final Cut workflow. Yeah. Though. And that's it. That that's the, it. It's final the, cut only for yeah. for assets. But for for what we do, we we have 
everything, you know, every drive, all the files that are connected to it, everything else is working with what was Chris, you know, it just grabs everything on the drive, um, which is super useful for us. Anyway, That's next super question. Super quick snapshot. Uh, Dan Burt says, uh, concerning the WLM meter, if I install the plugin, what does it do or enable? Is it only usable through another app like OBS, BMix, et cetera, or is it standalone? Tucker? Yeah, it's a, so it's a VST plugin. You, you do need a VST host of some sort. If you're on Mac, um, you can use um, Audio Hijack. That's what a lot of us are doing. If you're on PC, in my case, I've got it as a plugin inside of uh, vMix, but there's several different uh, platforms that you can use to host the VST plugin. Uh, next question. Uh, the next question would be uh, A. Mitchell's. What was the link to the tool for the iPad that Alex mentioned earlier? I think it was the I, syncing tool. It's hit to me dash broadcast.tv. It's a really bad link because <laughs> you have to look for it. But, but uh, I put it in the, in the chat. Uh, so that's the, um, that's, so what that, it's the same team that built Validate. So those who know who, what Validate is, uh, Validate was by Bell, I think. And then it was bought by, you know, it, it, it got bought a couple times and everything else. The team finally left, disappeared. I think they waited for their non-competes to disappear. And then they went and wrote a new one. And so this is the new Validate. And it's basically, it does 4K. It has a bunch of extra tools. But one of the things they added was the ability to have a hardware receiver um, that can be activated to look at iPads. And so you can have one in a central location for your streams and someone can just be on site and just hold up an iPad with the audio, with their mic or whatever. And it will use that to analyze um, analyze the audio sync automatically. And you don't have, we used to have to have a piece of hardware on the other, on both sides uh, or a video that we generated on both sides. Um, and this is better. There you go. You can see the um, Lee Love is showing that right there. There. Oh, that's another one. Stream Geeks. Yep. Um, and so that's a visual one. This the Hitomi one is a hardware one where you just you literally turn it on and it just goes. This is your offset, and it's super accurate. And so, um, but yeah, the, what, Lee, can you tell tell us what that iPad app is again? Yeah, it was. It's basically just a video that was created by this PTZ Optics guys. And what you do is you download it, you play it, you hold it up in front of your camera, and then it has a mark every second. You bring that into your yep. editor, you can line it up, and you'll know exactly how far and, your audio is off from your video. And what and what we do, you know, what I do to do that um, without any of these tools, if I have to is I either have someone do a clap and they have to do it like this where they, they pop out or they bring up a, a slate and they just go whack, you know? And then I grab the actual segments out of my encoder, throw them into Final Cut and look at them. You know, and I just go, here's the audio, here's the video. And when I move it, I figure out how many frames I'm, you know, to line it back up again. That's, the, that's my offset. So you, you don't need any tools to do it, but it's faster if you have like a, the, the, the Hitomi version of it, you put it up and you can sit there and dial it in, you know, as you're, you know, in real time. And so it's really fast from a production perspective and it works really well. We've used them on site. In fact, we used them before they were shipping. Anyway, next question. Uh, real quickly, you've mentioned this before. If you're doing 30 frames a second and you're dealing in milliseconds, I'm doing math here. So, and I take a thousand and I divide it by 30. Does that 33? 30 milliseconds. It's, 30 it's about 33 30... milliseconds of a frame. Per frame, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Just yep. On base, base 30. Just confirming In base 60, it's 15. Yep, yep, absolutely. A train leaves okay. Chicago. Um, uh, Jeremy Wallace says, has anyone been able to get their hands on the LiveView LU800 to evaluate the four camera mux uh, that it makes over bonded cellular? Curious Jeff. how they handle the audio. Jeff. Still waiting on ours. Still waiting on ours. Very, very, very not patiently at all. Uh, <laughs> at all. Uh, all right. So basically what it comes down to on the LU800 is it's going to be first coming out as a one input uh, for it's supposed to be today, July 1st, uh, for July's release, and then add in the four inputs down the road. It's probably sometime around September. It may go one to two and then to four, uh, but that's basically what their product uh output is what they're trying to do uh the the box itself will be capable from the start but it'll be software upgradable uh in the field uh so whenever you need it you can actually just turn it on so if you had a single channel you can turn it on to four for an event or something like that from audio uh perspective it's supposed to be two channels from the start two channels per input 
So a left and right stereo per input, possibly four channels, but they are long goal trying to get to eight channels to satisfy some of the bigger broadcasters. Like for instance, when we go to ESPN, they're honestly looking for a minimum of eight channels, if not the 16 channel transport. So it just depends on where your destinations are and what use it is. Yeah, and and I, the only thing I have to say for a live view is that, you know, you should find somebody else to do your 3D animations of your product. Um, that's not good. Anyway, so, um, you know, like it's, that's, you know, it was good, that was good 10 years ago, but there's a product, you know, there's, that looks like it came straight out of CAD. Anyway, so uh, next, next, next question. Uh, Josh, Josh Clayton says, uh, is it possible to use Adobe Bridge to help with video assets as a DAM or MAM? Uh, type of solution or workaround. I uh, go ahead, Jason. Yes, but please don't. There are many, many much <laughs> faster ways to do it. There you go. All right. What are some of the much faster ways to do it? Uh, um, I mean, I use um, ah, what's it called? Edit. Oh, it's the one that you had that was working, um, and it messed it up in in um. Uh, was the 444 thing that messed up the alpha channel. That's what I still use. Edit right. um, something, edit ready. Right. Yep, yep, okay. Yep, all right. Uh, next question. For the record, Grant, if it's spelled with one M, it's not a clean show violation. Um, a. Mitchell says, uh, let's see. Ooh, that's kind of long. Sorry, I'm going to skip over that one. Uh, yeah. Sorry, dismiss. You can abbreviate it and repost it. And remember, uh, I saw I saw metadata go by. The day the, the data asked for metadata is tomorrow at after eight. If you have any questions about metadata related to documentaries oh, yeah. or real, you know, we have the world expert showing up tomorrow uh, to talk about it. And uh, we're gonna. I think we're gonna try to drag Roscoe in to have the conversation with uh, you know. Uh, so with Phil, and so we're gonna between the two of them. I think that that will. Uh, um, we'll have a good conversation there. So, so anyway, so let's, uh, ne next question, but, but metadata is tomorrow, tomorrow after eight is the best time to do that. Yep. Go ahead. The huge okay. day. Okay. Uh, useful it things you might buy if you had nothing barring one, uh, MacBook pro or one windows 10 laptop and suddenly had an it budget of $5,000. Meraki is a commitment just so you know, like it's a great, I mean, amazing platform to manage stuff, uh, especially remotely for teams and remote things. I, on a budget, I'd probably use, and Aaron would probably agree with me is Ubiquity. Ubiquity is probably a, a more cost-effective solution. Um, you don't, the creature comforts aren't, the creature comforts with Ubiquity uh, that Meraki has aren't in Ubiquity, um, but Ubiquity will do 85, 90% of what Meraki will. Um, for me, I'm always gonna use Meraki's just because I just really know them well and they're very effective. Um, but, but again, I would, I would say, uh, ubiquity is probably the cost effective one. Just remember that Meraki costs money every, I think I, at, at my height, I think I spent $5,000 a year on just on my Meraki subscriptions for every piece of hardware. So, so it was, you know, like, that's not, that's not the hardware that just, that's just the subscriptions to be part of the cloud. Cause every one of those devices has a, has a management subscription cost oh, wow. that is running. So you just have to keep that in mind. Uh, it's worth it. Like if you're doing a lot of work and you're trying to, you know, make all that work, if you're, if you have that many devices and you're doing that much work, it, it, it pays for itself. But, but you need to know that it, it is a commitment. You're paying a couple hundred bucks, uh, you know, or, you know, anywhere from 50 to $200 a, a year per device to have it managed. Um, Jeff and then Tucker. Just, and then Colin. just be wary about what you're using with that network. If you're use, planning on using NDI, Meraki is not the answer, unfortunately. Uh, it, they have certain things in their mix that are messing a lot mm. of NDI workflows up. So know what you're planning to do. And, and is Ubiquity work better for that? Ubiquity does work better. Yes, there you go. But Tucker the and then Colin? Arista. Arista? Okay, Arista. Uh, Tucker and then Colin, quickly. Uh, 15 uh, seconds, we're, we're going to speed round. Hire a IT pro for $2,000 to find you the best $3,000 solution. Yeah, yeah, that's probably that is probably the right solution there, Colin. Yeah, more or less. Uh, there are many things you could spend three thousand dollars on, but since we're talking about routers, uh, you might also consider Zixel. They make excellent routers for small enterprise environments. They also uh, provide really good access uh, wireless access points. We should state at this point: do not use wireless for your broadcast purposes. But yeah, there yeah. you go. Very, oh, very and okay. uh, most of these companies that uh, have uh, management clouds with their routers, 
you're not going to brick your hardware if you don't subscribe to the service. You're just missing things like spam yep. filtering of various kinds and and yep. a, and <clears throat> intrusion detection and that kind of thing. But do check it out before you buy these things just to make sure. Yep. Next question. We're going to go speed round now. Uh, your lighting looks great, Colin. Uh, Abraham Barrera says, Abraham, will well, you... This is worth saying. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Guy for his excellent help in this. He said, let there be light. And there was light on day one. <laughs> will you have any speakers right. talking about motion graphics like Cinema 4D or After Effects? Absolutely. We're, we're, we're basically building around uh, Fridays being kind of a visual effects 3D. Um, so having Steve right here this Friday is part of that move. Um, and so we'll have more of that and we will definitely have more folks talking about that. I'm probably going to try to uh, drag Stu Mashwitz on at some point, talk about After Effects and, and we'll talk and possibly even mix it with some cinema stuff since he now works in Red Giant and, and uh, um, uh, Maxon are the same now. So, so anyway, so we're, we're, work, we're working on, on, on getting that in. So absolutely. Not, right, not this week, but soon. All right. Next question. Uh, Peter Moore, uh, bear with me here. Late question from me, ATEM Mini rebooted my dual boot Linux and Windows PC. Linux is prim primary, so Grub is the boot loader. ATEM Mini didn't show the BIOS loader on the PC, nor the Grub boot menu. Thoughts? That's hard for a Mac user to say all that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I, 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 go ahead, Colin. I was waiting for Colin. I was like, where's Colin? Like, um, where, why is his hand up? All right. My inclination is if you're looking for post screens on a PC, you're going to get those out of the built-in uh, video output and not out of something else. So you're probably out of luck unless you arrange some sort of loopback. Uh, and there are options usually in BIOS to, to route the uh, post screen to different uh, video output if you've got... A motherboard capable of that but uh, it'll take some doing probably i think that was the question it it, it seemed sort of roundabout yeah. no it's good it's good it's a good answer uh next question jan landy says congratulations on the 100th office hours what are the top five things you have learned over the course of the show it could almost be a whole hour Hard to speak. Yeah, I mean, that. I think that we we kind of talked through it on Sundays a lot of what we're what we're learning. I don't know about the top five. I think that, I mean, I definitely did not calculate for the quality that the panel would become. You know, like the thing I learned was just if you keep doing it, you know, there's this there's this cross pollination that's happening on the panel, and even the quality of the attendees and the quality of you know uh, Discord and and the the quality of the conversation. I think that um, uh, I didn't project that you know like it was you know it just it just kind of happened um and uh and i think that it just keeps getting better and and so um so i think that's the biggest thing that i learned um i i do think that there are things that i already had theories about that i think are accurate you know keeping a clean show um you know staying you know kind of folk you know focused you know there's a bunch of uh you know people using real names and and so on and so forth i think are are things that i've already done before but i'm learning that they're they're just i'm only more set in my ways now than I was before. Um, and anyway, uh, 30 or 15 seconds or 20 seconds, we've got a couple more questions. I don't want to lose them. So Jason, Sky, Tucker, and then Bill, and then Grant. Uh, DVE store, the blog, um, guys got a really great top 10 things I learned on uh, Office Hours. There you go. Okay, yeah, there practice, we go. Check that out. Practice. Yeah, yeah, practice. that's great. Thanks, practice, thanks, Guy. Practice, practice, I'm done. Anyway, go ahead, Sky, practice. Practice, practice, practice. Right, yeah, Tucker. Uh, just how to be more concise in, in uh, answers and questions. Yeah, absolutely, Bill. And the most important thing for me is that watching all these people who have deep levels of expertise is that there's a surface level, which is great. You've got to learn that before you can move on. But there's depth to all of these disciplines that even I, mm -hmm. after all these years in the business, didn't understand in all these areas. So just being mm -hmm. exposed to that has been incredible. Yeah, Grant, and then Carl. Uh, I, I think uh, Alex set the standard by being an open book and just sharing everything. And that has expanded all through the network and is uh, the, how that's flowed out across the world um, is, uh, is amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Carl? Online, offline learning. There's, there's, we get a lot done live, but the Discord portion of it where you can go if you don't have time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that there's, 
I mean, there, the, the other thing that I am learning is how important the conversation is. So we're, you'll see us leaning more and more towards sticking with conversation and less presentation. So, um, you know, I think that being, con you know, Chris has been great about like just knowing Chris Summers has been great. Um, just kind of flowing with the conversation about cameras. Like there's a contextual thing. Of course I call on him right when he's right when he's adjusting. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, but I think that what we're seeing is how visceral it is when we're asking questions and conversing and how, you know, a long presentation is, I become impatient with that everywhere on the web now, because I'm just so used to us having a conversation about it. Um, and I'm just seeing how powerful that is. I don't think it's the be all end all, but I do think it's a, it, it, I'm, I'm surprised at how, uh, how these hours kind of disappear. I mean, we spend three hours talking and they just seem to evaporate, you know, for me anyway. Um, I, I, I'm always like, I can't believe I only got another five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever. Uh, anyway, next, thanks. Uh, next question. Uh, Gabriel says the A10 production 4K HyperDex and AJA ROI converters have reference inputs. Uh, is it essential that these are connected in a live show? And if yes, what should they be referencing to? Go ahead, Jason, and then Tucker, and we'll do that real quickly, Thir uh, 30 seconds each. Okay, so real quick, AJA and Blackmagic are not using the same, and correct me if I'm wrong, but AJA is actually using some sort of time code, whereas the reference is Blackburst or TriSync on, on Blackmagic. I could have that wrong. The short answer is the more stuff you have connected, the more important it is that you use them. Go ahead, Tucker. Yeah, it's just a matter of frame sync. Uh, they almost all of these devices have the ability to to frame sync themselves, um, and but it costs you time to make that happen. If you provide a reference signal that is back to either a general overall time sync uh, or time source, which could be your master switcher or could be a dedicated time clock, um, you will drop from like one frame of latency to one line of latency. So. Yeah, and 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 that adds up because remember you're going to lose that everywhere. As everything is resyncing, you're losing uh, half a frame, quarter frame. So you can end up losing hundreds of milliseconds. You know, in that process when they're not when they're not all sunk together in a where that where you lose a, a fraction of that if you are if you go through that. Roscoe, really quickly. Yeah, uh, and a chamber orchestra does need a conductor. A large orchestra does. That's what's syncing and all the references for a large orchestra. That's great. Uh, next question. Uh, I'm planning on using the Huddle Cam HD Pros HDMI out into an ATEM mini switcher. The Huddle Cam HD Pro um, is a USB webcam and also has HDMI out. I don't know what that oh, is. Oh, we, we didn't get to a question there. So, I, yeah. Yeah. So, no, anyway, next, next question. And uh, A. Mitchell says Can the keynote, presumably in the next hour, be run as a screen share as opposed to a webcam so it's more readable and less blurry? Thanks. Yeah, I think, uh, what's your what's your plan, Chris? Are you, you're doing screen share, aren't you? Um, we have the thing set up with Mickey like we did the last okay. three weeks. Let's I don't know it. if that let's harms the quality. No, let's, no, no, no let's, let's do it this way because I think that we're at 720 because I think Guy is joining from a room, which Thank I you, think Guy. I have to build into my system. But I've seen 720 the whole time. So let's we're going to go ahead and, okay. and see how that looks. Um, is, uh, I, I think that there's... Are the attendees seeing 720? I'm only seeing 640. Oh, no, I see 720. Yeah, yeah, try pulling the window larger, too. I find that if it's small, it'll, uh, Zoom, if you look at the stats, will give you 640 by 480. Yeah, one of, the prerequisites, one of the prerequisites of mm -hmm. Zoom to get the 720 or for the, for the higher end the plans, like the corporate ones, is that it has to be in full screen. Oh, interesting. Very good point. You have to be in full screen. Otherwise, yeah. like in Zoom, you have to click full screen. Otherwise, it will not give you 720. Yeah, they have a, they have a, a document online that, that tells you how to get 720 or 1080 for the corporate uh, accounts. Well, no, I'm not in full screen and I'm still seeing it. So um, it may depend on your resolution, your monitor well, or something. I think the question is, I think that it seems that people that are in the paint we're going to stick with it now and we'll take that into account. Um, we're not going to change the pipeline before this one, but we will uh, play with that some more to see, to see whether we're, it, it seems that the folks that are attendees are, uh, if you see the stats, um, the way to see stats, even if you're an attendee is to go into your, into your uh, video and into video settings and then go down to statistics and in statistics, you can hit video and it'll tell you what your um, what you're, what you're doing there. So that's, that's where you'd find that. Man, I'm uh, seeing abysmal numbers. Oh, it just went from from 320 to 640 to 1280 to 720. It, it just, it's yeah, it's 
floating. Well, it depends on whether you're in, it depends on what you're, you know, whether you're in a grid, you'll always have a small one. But if you're in full, if you're in, uh, if you're doing speaker view, you'll see whether it's, you have to turn it into speaker view to see that. So um, it looks like 640 by 360. So we'll take that into account, either making the slides easier to read or, or making it, uh, or figuring out how to do screen share. The problem with screen share is it just kind of takes over everything. So we tend not to, makes it hard to cut and make an interesting show. So um, anyway, I am going to, uh, Chris, you're able to, I have to, my production that normally is on Thursdays and Fridays goes moved to Wednesdays and Thursdays. So uh, just this week. So I am not going to be able to sit through this. So unacceptable, um, I'm, Alex, unacceptable. I know, I know the hundredth and I, I wanted to get through this part, but then I have to now go to work. We're so take um, away your OG status. Yeah, he's calling the ah, attention again. That's it. Oh, dag nabbit. Happy so anyway, it's called um, Alex Lindsay's day, office hours. Alex. We're booting Happy you. hundredth day. Happy thank you. I just Happy want to thank everybody. Uh, I can't believe we did this a hundred times. <laughs> and you. I just, you. Um, you know, before I, before I walk off, I just want to thank everyone that has been contributing so much to this. It's not just, just show, just showing up has been a contribution. The, the, um, whether the panelists uh, bringing incredible knowledge, the attendees, uh, you know, asking great questions and being part of this and, and the mass, the, the, when we're all here, what allows us to have great speakers and what will continue to allow us to get better and better speakers is the fact that I can say there's going to be 250, 300 people that are going to be there to watch, you know, that, that the audience drives the content. And so the bigger we can, you know, if we can share it, if we can, you know, get people, you know, bring more people in the, the larger that audience, the better the content will get. I think that the panel will continue to get better. The, the, the size of the audience uh, gives us leverage. Um, and so that's my goal as far as growing, growing it is just to get um, to increase that market leverage um, so that we can keep on uh, getting more and more people to come talk to us. Uh, it makes it much easier. We can all learn from our home and, and they can come and, and help us do that. And so, um, you know, so definitely share it and thank you for everyone. And also thank, thank you for the team that has helped us with Discord, uh, with the folks that, you know, you know, everyone that's been helping with asking questions and doing second hours. And there's just so much contribution here, you know, that, that, that's not me. And I just want to, um, you know, thank everybody for, I, it's, it's all of us uh, doing, doing something that's kind of special. And I don't know where it's going. I don't know. I don't even know what this is. <laughs> you know, like it's just like it just. I started it one day, and here we are. And and it just keeps getting better. And it definitely it's still a hundred in. It's still my favorite thing to do every day. It's easy to get up every morning and and get ready to go and 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 hang out with all of you. So, um, anyway, so so thank you very much. And um, I will see you all bright and early uh, tomorrow morning. All right, bye guys. Thanks, thank Alex. you. Thank right, you. Thank you. Uh, and Mickey's the host. Uh, Mickey, can you make me co-host? So, Chris, you yes, have sir. some stuff for us, yeah?